Hello, I'm delighted to share this project, Out on the Waters, Image and Meaning in an Indian Princess Ship Figurehead. Before I begin, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to Matt Thurlow and everyone at the Decorative Arts Trust for inviting me to share this work at the Fall Symposium and to make it accessible to all of you now. I would also be remiss if I did not thank Professors William Moore and Ross Barrett at Boston University and George Schwartz, Associate Curator at the Peabody Essex Museum for their support and enthusiasm for this work. In this presentation, I will address what has come to be known as the Indian Princess Figurehead, dated around 1875, which stands prominently in the East India Marine Hall at the Peabody Essex Museum. As I will address topics pertaining to Indigenous representation, settler colonialism, and westward expansion, I am compelled to pay respect to the many Indigenous communities that have lived and passed through the place where the figurehead stands, and to those today for whom it is their people's ancestral land. By acknowledging the communities of the Pawtucket, Penacook, Nipmuc, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and many others, we pay respect to them and their elders and descendants, past and present. And with that, I am happy to begin. Foreign and fanciful to our modern eyes, ship figureheads were once pervasive in the visual culture of coastal America. In the early years of the 19th century, the typical zoomorphic form of the figurehead gave way to an anthropomorphic model in which a variety of characters emerged. Representations of political figures, young women, Native Americans, classical goddesses and heroes, among others, all took their places on the prows of their respective vessels. Conceived of often as visual embodiments of their respective ship's names, they generally conform to a series of what we might call archetypes, rarely breaking free from their classifications. Yet the Indian princess figurehead seems to complicate the rigidity of these figural types. In my talk today, I classify the figurehead as an archetypal assemblage, one that conveyed to its viewers a constructed view of tamed nativeness that persisted within American visual and literary culture. First, I will address the attribution of the figurehead and summarize what is known and not known about its original maker and ship context. Next, I will assess each of the archetypes the figurehead embodies and explain their possible meanings to 19th century viewers. In my conclusion, I will consider how the image of the figurehead corresponded to national and regional understandings of weakening indigenous resistance and assimilation and posit ways in which we might complicate this narrative. I should tell you up front that many of my questions about the figurehead remain unanswered, but I hope you will enjoy this foray into my detective work and analysis and share my excitement in continuing to uncover this mystery. The Indian Princess figurehead came into the collection of the then Peabody Museum of Salem in 1924 through a donation from the family of Robert Swain Peabody, a prominent architect working in Boston in the late 19th century. During his lifetime, he amassed a collection of figureheads that he displayed proudly in the garden of his summer home at Peaches Point in Marblehead. As you can see in these photos, over the years, many figureheads in the garden, particularly our Indian princess, fell into disrepair. Many of the figureheads in the garden can be traced to their original ship contexts, and perhaps found their way to Peabody after their ships were decommissioned. But as we shall see, the origin of the Indian princess figurehead is a little more serious. In its original state, the figurehead would have appeared much differently than what we see today. As was common in the late 19th century, she would have been painted entirely white, evoking the look of neoclassical sculpture. At left, a photograph showing the figurehead installed in the East India Marine Hall in 1943 shows the figurehead after repainting and before restoration. Fortunately, the Index of American Design gives us this 1937 watercolor to allow a closer look. A later photograph of the installation shows that the figurehead was repainted sometime between the years 1937 and 1959. It is difficult to see, but in the detail, you can discern that she has dark hair and has a restoration of her left arm, which was constructed to be detachable, but later became lost. While it is unclear why her figurehead was repainted in this manner, the result is a visually stunning impression where the details of her hair, dress, and attributes are much more legible to the viewer. As of 1940, our figurehead had no attributed maker, but from about the mid 20th century, the figurehead has been attributed to C.A.L. Sampson of Bath, Maine in both literature and museum contexts. Sampson worked as a ship and ornamental carver in the mid 19th century. Few period records associated with Sampson survive and the details about his production and clientele are difficult to discern. What is known is that he began his career in Boston and moved to Bath, Maine in 1848 to open up his own business. There, he apprenticed for about four years under prominent carver G.B. McLean. 
His activities in Bath halted for a time in the early 1860s when he served as a captain in the Civil War, but resumed upon his return to Bath in 1864. After his service, he produced figureheads for shipbuilders, Goss and Sawyer and others, and taught several younger ship carvers his craft. He remained in Bath until his death in 1881. Samson is recorded to have produced over 20 figureheads during his career, and here are four of the small number of extant examples from his body of work. Each of these examples correspond to the same figurehead type, the maiden, and represent fashionable young women of European descent. When viewed in comparison, these figures appear strikingly similar. Certain sartorial elements, specifically a ruffled bodice on top of a multi-layered skirt, appear in each example. The drapery of each is carved in shallow relief, giving the impression that multiple layers of fabric hug tightly to the figure's legs. Their poses, of which two hold an arm aloft and two have hands clasped to their breasts, are stationary, seemingly bound to the structures they would have adorned. Perhaps most striking, though, are their faces, which appear nearly identical. Samson is known to have procured a local girl as a model for the figurehead of the ship Mabel, and it is possible he may have used the same model for others he carved. In particular, the figurehead from the Forest Bell presents an intriguing connection to our figurehead thought to be from the Indian princess. This connect connection originates in a possible misidentification of the figurehead Forest Bell in Tom Armstrong's 200 Years of American Sculpture. An excerpt is seen at left. In his 1973 publication, A Maritime History of Bath, Maine and the Kennebec River Region, William A. Baker recounts a description of Samson's figurehead from the Forest Bell as, quote, a beautiful Indian maiden in the costume of Pocahontas, end quote. This description does not correspond to the image Armstrong provides for the Forest Bell figurehead, but seems instead to apply precisely to that of the Indian princess. At this time, it is yet unknown where Baker obtained his description for the Forest Bell figurehead. So is the Indian princess figurehead we know actually the Forest Bell? If we are to trust Baker, who does not list an Indian princess under Samson's works, it could be no other. But before we look at her original ship context and image for clues, we should take a look at the figurehead within Samson's body of work. As we can see, there are great qualitative differences between these figureheads and that from the Indian princess. Instead of standing stationary, our figurehead's posture is one that conveys an urgent forward motion. While the legs of the other figurehead seem to be bound, ours supports the entirety of her weight as she seems to lean upon it. Her stance is one that visually conveys a tremendous amount of potential energy, as if she might, at any moment, launch her body forward with the power of her bent left leg. Notable also is the positioning of her arms and hands, which do not correspond to either posture of the other figureheads. Additionally, her facial features are quite different than those of the young maiden. Her lips are generous and full, and her brow line is severe. When viewed from the side, her nose and jawline create a prominent and visually striking profile. Overall, the impression created by the artist is not a woman of European descent, but one that conforms more closely to contemporary representations of indigenous people. The figurehead's dress is also worthy of attention, as it differs dramatically from those of Samson's other attributed examples. The dress falls in dramatic folds around her shoulders, supported only by a central strap that curves around the left side of her neck. Below the dress's belt, substantial drapery set in deep relief clings to her body as if blown back by the wind, an illusionistic effect that accentuates the dynamism of her stance. These stylistic and subjective differences between our figurehead and Samson's others at the very least suggest that she is unique in his surviving body of work, and Baker's description creates an air of uncertainty around the circumstances of her making. And the mystery of our figurehead deepens when we begin to consider its original ship context. What we do know is that it likely adorned the bow of a clipper, a type of merchant sailing vessel built for speed and characterized by a long and slender hull. Our figurehead is referred to as belonging to the ship Indian Princess as early as 1922, but maritime records do not seem to provide support for this claim. In search for the original vessel, I found it prudent to seek references to the ship in the decades surrounding its supposed making. Versions of the annual list of merchant vessels of the United States from the years 1869, 1874, 1877, and 1878 do not list a single vessel by the name Indian Princess, and the historical ship database, Ship Index, is only two, one much earlier in the century, and another after Samson's death. These same records do, however, mention multiple vessels by the name Forest Bell. 
Given the similarities between Baker's description of the forest bell figurehead and qualities of the Indian princess, we might be able to assume that our figurehead belonged to one of these ships. Yet the uniqueness of the figurehead in Samson's body of work and the ubiquitous references to its place on the ship Indian Princess prevent the assertion of definitive claims. Locating records of the precise vessel that held the Indian Princess figurehead may not be possible, and definitively attributing it to a maker almost as difficult. But examining its image and placing it within its cultural context may bring us one step closer to understanding how she was both a product and communicator of contemporary visual culture. The visual world of the 19th century in America was an incredibly vibrant one. In urban and rural areas alike, elaborately painted tavern and retail signs, wooden sculptures, trade banners, and weather vanes defined a shared visual experience. Prioritizing image over text, these objects of material culture created a type of semiotic language of signifiers that communicated to viewers a complex system of meanings and associations. It is, when this, it is within this visual world that the figure had rose to prominence, and it is through that language that they communicated meaning to viewers. As I mentioned in my introduction, American ship figureheads in the 19th century took a variety of forms. They also conform to a series of well-established character types, what I propose as archetypes. Yet the Indian princess figurehead does not seem to conform to a single category of archetype. Instead, we can think of her as an archetypal assemblage, a framework that allows us to explore the many ways she embodied and conveyed semiotic meaning within the maritime community. The first archetype that the Indian princess figurehead conforms to is a broader category of the feminine. During the Age of Sail, femininity was intimately tied to the language of the sea. To this day, a ship is designated as a feminine object instead of a masculine or neuter. In 1850, William Chauncey Fowler gave this reasoning for the sailor's use of feminine language. Quote, the English language is philosophically correct in considering things without life of the neuter gender. Yet, by an easy analogy, the imagination conceives of inanimate things as animated and distinguished by sex. A ship the sailors call she, even when her name is masculine. It is curious to observe that laborers give the feminine appellation to those things only which are more closely identified with themselves and by the qualities and conditions of which their own efforts and character are effect, uh, as workmen are affected." End quote. Therefore, in designating the ship feminine, sailors linguistically indicated the intimate connection the ship had to both their work and their self-identification. The well-being of the ship was paramount to their livelihoods, and their faithful tending to her operations and structure reveals an illuminating codependence. A ship figurehead, a she that adorned the bow of the ship and in many cases corresponded to her name, served as the physical embodiment of the ship's identity. And though she became a semiotic indicator of ship mission and crew livelihood, her embodiment of the feminine archetype conveys only a small part of her significance. The second archetype that the Indian princess figurehead incorporates is that of the classical goddess. Perhaps driven by the rising popularity of neoclassical sculpture over the course of the 19th century, ship figureheads often took the form of classical goddesses or classicized allegories of virtue. By the mid-19th century, examples of classicized figures pervaded material and print culture and divided a, virtu a visual precedent from which ship carvers could draw. Two figureheads depicting the mythological nymph Galatea display similarities to the dress of the Indian princess figurehead. They are adorned in two different styles of classicized dress, which correspond to a type of ancient Greek dress known as a keton. These lightweight garments were comprised of a single sheet of lightweight material that could be arranged in a variety of ways and attached at the shoulder or shoulders with a pin. When placed in comparison with the Galatea figurehead from 1865, the Indian princess's dress is revealed to be particularly classicized. One can imagine that her dress is comprised of a single sheet attached at strategic points along her body to accentuate her figure. Yet this placement of neoclassical dress upon the Indian princess figurehead cannot simply be understood as a conformance to a popular 19th century artistic trend. To fully understand the significance of her classicized dress, we must turn to an exploration of her third embodied archetype, the Native American. When the image of the Native American first appeared in the form of a ship figurehead, it did so as a generalized type. Often highly stylized and portrayed in generic and exoticized dress incorporating feathers, beads, and furs, figures like these conveyed commonly held prejudices of either the threatening or noble savage. 
By this time, the Native American also became symbolic of America itself, as the indigenous figure had been used by Europeans to represent the New World since the 16th century. While most of the Native American figureheads made during the 19th century represented men, most often Indian chief types or warriors, images of Native American women were commonly taken as subjects for cigar store sculptures. These representations featured similarly generalized and imagined conceptions of indigenous dress and stressed a connection to tobacco, which had been used and held sacred in Native communities long before European colonization. This tendency to depict Native American women in generalized costume pervaded 19th century American and international print culture, so the presentation of the Indian princess figurehead may seem surprising for her unusual dress. For an explanation, we return to Baker's description of the Forest Bell figurehead as, quote, a beautiful maiden in the costume of Pocahontas. The story of Pocahontas first reached the European public through The General History of Virginia by Captain John Smith, published in 1624. Smith recounts many of his exploits within the colony of Virginia, but the part of his story that is of interest for our figurehead pertains to his harrowing tale of Native American capture. After slaying members of a local indigenous tribe, Smith was apprehended to answer for his crimes. Facing execution at the hands of the Powhatan chief, Smith writes that, quote, Pocahontas, the king's dearest daughter, when no entreaty could prevail, got his head in her arms and laid her own upon his to save him from death, end quote. Thus, Pocahontas sacrificed her well-being for the life of John Smith, and a legend was born. After its first publication in 1624, the story of Pocahontas slowly spread on both sides of the Atlantic. The first time Americans witnessed the character of Pocahontas was in 1808 with the premiere of James Nelson Barker's play The Indian Princess or The Belle Sauvage. In the play, the pivotal moment in which Pocahontas saves John Smith occurs at the beginning of Act Two, when the character of Chief Powhatan promises vengeance for Smith's slaying of members of his tribe. When John Smith is led to the execution block, a dramatic moment signals his impending demise. After Pocahontas pleads for mercy and finds none from her father, the reader encounters a stage direction. Music, the third signal for execution, is struck. The hatchets are lifted up when the princess, shrieking, runs distractedly to the block and presses Smith's head to her bosom. Pocahontas then exclaims, quote, White man, thou, sh thou shalt not die, or I will die with thee, end quote. Taken directly from Smith's general history, though certainly embellished with theatrical drama, this moment made fresh Pocahontas' sacrifice to an American audience, and it was a moment of sacrifice constructed firmly by the hegemonic world of the 19th century theater. Even in plays that featured indigenous characters, white actors played these roles, a reality which reinforced stereotypical and romanticized images of indigenous people. The popularity of the story of Pocahontas in American theater, and indeed in painted representations, should not be understated. After the debut of The Indian Princess, subsequent adaptations were put on in theaters across the American Northeast, each based on accounts of John Smith. These also adopted his escape from death as the pivotal climactic moment. Appealing to the emotions of their respective audiences, these plays made the Pocahontas legend and consequently shaped the way the American public viewed and mythologized the figure of Pocahontas. But Pocahontas symbolized much more than the savior of the white man. An analysis of historical events during the legend's popularization reveals a deeper, deeper level of her significance. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, Barker's The Indian Princess debuted the same year that President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act into law. Viewed today as an action akin to genocide, the Indian Removal Act displaced thousands of Native American individuals from their ancestral lands to federal territories west of the Mississippi River. It is telling that as this policy was enacted, the popular American conception of the Native American was formed largely through the story of Pocahontas. The dominant narrative was not one of oppression and persecution, but one that embodied the virtuous sacrifice of the selfless Indian princess. It can be said that, in the eyes of Americans, Pocahontas's rescue of John Smith justified the primacy of white prosperity and well-being, and by extension, ownership of native lands and westward expansion. The notions of sacrifice associated with the figure of the Indian princess, with Pocahontas, become particularly illuminating when applied to the Indian princess figurehead. One can imagine her fixed to the bow of a ship, breast bared to the elements. 
As in the story, the Indian princess glances upward with a look of apprehension and pleading, vigilant and concerned with impending threat. Her left arm, which crosses the front of her body, seems to convey a gesture of defense. She is the guardian of her crew in an uncertain maritime world of chaos and the unexpected. She is the noble and good savage, standing resolute, having thrown herself in defense of a people, of a culture, not her own. And the image of Pocahontas began to appear in print sources as her popularity in the theater rose. An illustration of Pocahontas by French artist Pierre Gustave Eugène, made before the figure had's tentative date of 1875, reveals a potential source for her unusual dress. In the illustration, Pocahontas wears a garment of loose white fabric, which she holds up to her chest with her left hand in a gesture of modesty. In her right hand, she holds a tobacco pipe, seemingly adorned with feathers. This image, featured in Mary Cowden Clark's publication, World Noted Women, was well known in America in 1866, within a decade of the assumed date of the figurehead's carving. While it is unknown if the figurehead's carver saw this particular image, its striking similarities to our own composition make the idea worthy of consideration. Our figurehead's left arm crosses her classicized dress in a similarly protective gesture, and her right hand holds an unidentified object covered in browned paint, a visual suggestion of tobacco leaves, or perhaps feathers. The correlation between the Indian princess figurehead and the Pocahontas legend is further strengthened by its popularization in 19th century American poetry. Pocahontas, an 1841 epic poem by Lydia Sigourney, reminds us that her story does not end with her role in John Smith's redemption. In fact, it continues with her marriage to John Rolfe and, ass and assimilation into Anglo-Colonian culture. In the poem, Sigourney recounts the legend of the title character. Two stanzas in particular, articulating Pocahontas' marriage and departure from her native land, conjure a sentimental image of wifely virtue as well as adventure. Young wife, how beautifully the months swept by. With thy bower methinks I view thee still, the meek observance of thy lifted eye, bent on thy lord and prompt to do his will. The care for him, the happiness to see his soul's full confidence repose in thee the sacrifice of self, the ready skill in duty's path, the love without alloy. These give each circling year a brighter crown of joy. Out on the waters, on the deep, deep sea, out, out upon the waters, surging foam, swelled by the winds, rolls round her wild and free, and memory wandereth to her distant home, to fragrant gales, the blossom boughs that stir, to the sad sire who fondly dreams of her. But kindling smiles recall the thoughts that roam, for at her side a bright-haired nursling plays, while bends her bosom lord with fond, delighted gaze. When juxtaposed with the Indian princess figurehead, the first stanza has us understand her upward gaze as one of meek observance toward her husband, prompt to do his will, and as one of an attentive and dutiful wife. Her sacrifice is here a sacrifice of self to conform to her marital duty. In this light, the figurehead represents not only a guardian of the crew, but a remembrance of the crew's wives, who loyally awaited the appearance of their ship on the horizon. This interpretation also corresponds to her role as a savior of John Smith, one who as caretaker would put herself in danger for the well-being of others. Just as Pocahontas in her journey to Europe sailed out on the waters on the deep, deep sea, out surging foam swelled by the winds rolls round her wild and free, the figurehead would have conveyed a sense of freedom as she rode the bow of the Indian princess through the swells. And similarly, as Pocahontas's memory wandereth to her distant home, the figurehead physically returned periodically to her place of origin. Though she feels the freedom of the open ocean, Pocahontas's memory wanders to the life she left behind. Similarly, the ship figurehead is grounded and bound physically and symbolically to the function of the ship as icon and sacrificial protectress. The Indian princess has undergone a change in identity, now synonymous not with indigeneity, but with a service to her crew. During the 19th century, the name Pocahontas became synonymous with the title of Indian princess, as well as with other titles, including the forest princess and perhaps even the forest belle. In fact, figure, the figure had visually communicated the image of the Indian princess of Pocahontas so forcefully that she became known by that name after her removal from her original ship context, which has yet to be discovered. 
An analysis of the Indian princess as a figurehead archetypal assemblage has allowed us to understand the creation of her image as sacrificial protectress and as a symbol of native tolerance. But of course, our story cannot end quite yet. In conclusion, I'd like to note some important context for interpreting our figurehead. The coastal region between the North Shore of Massachusetts and Bath, Maine was originally home for a variety, a variety of indigenous communities. Gradual colonial expansion over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries caused the relocation of countless indigenous peoples, and land seizure was a catalyst for many instances of raids and warfare. Differing greatly from those Americans who lived on the frontier, 19th century East Coast Americans were no longer preoccupied with warring native groups or the dangers that accompanied land disputes. As the age of sail progressed, the coast began to be dominated by merchant vessels, and the lands and waters that had once sustained the livelihoods of indigenous groups became even more dominated by expanding Anglo-Maritime communities. This shift coincided with governmental actions to assimilate native children in purpose-built boarding schools and the passage of the Indian Appropriations Act of 1871, which stipulated that no group of Native Americans was to be recognized as an independent nation thenceforth. In this context, it would be easy to consider the Indian princess as purely an iconographical taming of the native image or subjugation of the native threat. But a well-rounded interpretation of the Indian princess figurehead bears examination within another framework. It is important to remember the ways that indigenous peoples maintained agency in the 19th century Northeast. For instance, in Maine and south towards Massachusetts, indigenous involvement with the coast became intimately tied with tourism. The Wabanaki people had been pushed back from the coast by the aforementioned Anglo-Maritime communities, then displaced once again by the encroachment of the farming and logging industries. Yet, they returned to the coast and asserted a new sense of agency within the coastal space. They repurposed resources to make marketable goods for summer visitors, which included the making of traditional baskets and moccasins. The byproducts of the latter could then be used to lubricate farm equipment and provide lighting oil for coastal communities. These were also there were also indigenous sailors who participated in New England whaling industries, manning ships of other purposes, and in some cases even attaining the rank of captain or first mate. And just as there were along the Great Lakes, there were likely indigenous ship carvers. In the liminal space of the coast, where the tamed image of the Indian princess figurehead perhaps came to life, the Wabanaki people were asserting economic, cultural, and social independence, resisting assimilation in a way that allowed them to assert nativeness on their own terms. An attempt to uncover the mystery of the Indian princess figurehead has yielded fascinating interpretive possibilities and raised many questions. She remains suspiciously unique in C.A.L. Sampson's body of work, and her original ship context remains unknown. She does not conform to one figurehead archetype, but instead emerges as an embodiment of three, the female, the classical goddess, and the Native American. In one interpretation, the image of the Indian princess figurehead seems to reflect hegemonic conceptions of 19th century indigeneity. Her classicized dress, subjective connection to the legend of Pocahontas, and production in the predominantly white industry of ship figurehead carving supports this claim. Yet to neglect an interpretation of the figurehead that acknowledges indigenous agency would be to ignore a great portion of her interpretive possibilities. There is, of course, more work to be done, but for now she serves as an enduring example not only of a ship carver's creative interpretation of a popular legend, but of the ways in which Native American history was intertwined with the maritime community during the Age of Sail. Thank you. <laughs>